thank you for joining us in another episode of Experience, Strength, and Hope. My name is Catherine, and our host, Tony, will be joining us shortly. Our goal is to bring stories that make you laugh, smile, and even cry, but most of all, give you hope. Please don't forget to support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel and following us on Spotify, Anchor FM, and Apple Podcasts. Today, Tony is joined by three men of various backgrounds. Listen as they tell their stories about finances, life's lessons, and raising African-American men in today's society. Again, I'm Catherine, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Three men with me today. This is the first time I did it with more than one person. And so uh, to my left, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and a little bit about themselves. So my name is Christian James, um, licensed master social worker. Uh, done a lot of work in the community, currently working outside of the community though, but I'm just glad to be here, hoping to share a little bit of wisdom. My name is uh, Jimmy Turner. Uh, I'm retired from the military. I work with, I guess, uh, Trouble you for a while uh, during my time, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Also, I love Jesus. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Joseph Smith. Um, I'm an LMSW as well. Um, work with kids and community in different communities around uh, Kansas. Um, um, kids in need, and I, now I work as a generator social worker in the school district. And uh, I'm also a disabled retired veteran. And I'm Antonio Tim, if one knows me. One thing, I just want to start off with this. Um, when you were talking, I don't remember what type of insurance it was, but I remember we were at the old group building, and uh, Jimmy was getting on the, uh, well, I don't want to say that. Jimmy was getting on a young man about not having, you were telling him about not having insurance. Mm-hmm. I don't think he had either life or health insurance or things like that, and how important it is. And so just uh, as a group first, that's, I know it's probably far from what I want to talk about, but just as far as uh, the anywhere, it seems like we have a younger population that don't think, you know, and I'm talking about men and women, but don't think, a lot of men don't think that they need life insurance or health insurance. And you can see that a lot before. Every time someone dies, they got to go fund me behind them. Like some of them don't have it. Okay, I understand that it's more cost involved. You know, if I die, y'all might have a go fund me for me too. You know? <laughs> but just uh, uh, just far as out of the... Uh, not just the financial part of it, you know, because I know it costs money to get that. You know, that's the first thing that people look at and say, well, I can't afford that. You know, I don't want that that extra 50 or uh, $75 coming out of my check every month or whatever it might be. Do you, you remember the time, Jimmy? It was, I know it was a long, you just dropped so much wisdom on it, but it was, <laughs> I know it was a long time ago. <laughs> it's been a while. I don't remember that, that particular incident. Mm-hmm. But, you know, however, it is very important to have insurance. You know, I just look at, I guess, life from the beginning to the end. And I like to look in the past at my ancestors and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and each generation should be doing better than the generation that came before them. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so, you know, if you don't do it for yourself, you know, do it for the loved ones in your life. You know, you know. I just think about how my great great grandfather passed the baton off to my great grandfather, then him to his father and my father. You know, and so now I think that this is my time. You know, to make sure that the Turner name is still going forward, and and when I pass on, 
you know, my children and my grandchildren could look at me back and say, yeah, you know, our grandfather, you know, made sure that we had what we need to pass on to the next generation. All right. Joe, you should say something. I kind of agree with Jimmy. Like, for me, being the oldest, oldest in my family, the oldest grandchild and the oldest great-grandchild, a lot of pressure has been put upon mm. me. Um, insurance is definitely important because my grandfather used to talk about it and my mom. She said, I'd rather make $2 less an hour and have good benefits so you can be able to, if something happens to me, it can be taken care of. And you're right, a lot of youngsters, they don't believe. It's even people my age, and I'm, I'm 43, they don't believe in having health insurance and, and those type of insurance, but you gotta have it. Just like if you got a car, you gotta have insurance on it to go around legally. And I only have one child, so when I leave here, um, he has to be pretty much set up. I don't want him to worry about Hey, is dad, I got to get a GoFundMe or I got to have uh, sale meals to put my dad in the ground. No, I want you to be taken care of, you know, and passed. And, and like Jimmy said, each generation, something I truly believe each generation should be better. Now, it, with me, with my family, I'm like the outcast. I went off and just did did my own thing. And mm-hmm. and that was because being the oldest, my great, my grandmother and my, my grandfather I lived with them early in life and they instilled so much in me that my other cousins and my sisters don't have so and they died pretty early but they they instilled these things in me like you come from you come from something you come from a good family you need your great grandfather did this your grandfather did this you need to move keep the thing moving and that's the sad part in my family a lot of people don't follow they look at me like I think I'm better to know I just had to come out here in Kansas and do most of this on my own. And when you can depend on yourself, that is that is the strongest thing you can have in life. I don't have nobody to depend on. It's just Joe. It's, y'all more like family. Y'all in this room because I don't have my. I see you guys more than I see my people in my blood. Okay. So the insurance thing, you got to have that because if some, something happens to you, and you you don't have something, your family is going to suffer. And I'd have been around other people who family didn't, was not set up and then they selling hot dogs and stuff, trying to put them in the ground, you know, mm-hmm. to, you know, and have a service. Christian. So I'm in a weird position because I'm only 30, so I feel young, but I feel old at the same time. <laughs> you only 30, Christian? I'm only 30. Are you serious? <laughs> so. You were 10 when you were working I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the weird part for me is I thought I was invincible too. That's why it took me a long time to get health insurance. I don't need to take an extra twenty dollars out. <laughs> That's twenty dollars I could put in gas tank. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then life insurance. I just recently, I think in the last six months, got my first life. Well, that wasn't regulated with the business. I got my own policy. And the big part of what kicked that off was I had so many people my age are dying right now, in their twenties and their thirties. Like I've had multiple friends that have been put on life support just because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And they're in their 20s. Wow. And so, and I've had a few that have passed away. And so I'm like, and I see the GoFundMe's. I see, mm-hmm. you know, we need help. We need to bury this person. And I'm like, I don't want to put my family in that position. Mm-hmm. And so, especially with me traveling back and forth to work, I got me a higher policy because I know the likelihood of something happening okay. is a lot higher than if sense. I just were close to home. Yeah. And so, but I've also, heck, when I, I ended up cutting my leg one day at the, I had to go into like an emergency room because I ended up getting a deep cut on my leg. Even after insurance, that was four hundred dollars out of pocket. <laughs> so <laughs> just imagine without it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm like, to me, you a few dollars extra. But I don't think they understand the importance of having it, not putting that burden on your family, but also protecting yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, if you get put out of work, there's a lot of things in place where yeah, it's going to cost you a few extra dollars, but. It's going to save you a long, and you're not invincible. I don't care if you're 15, I don't care if you're 25 or 35. You're not invincible. So when you think it happening, you've got to be smart and prepare yourself for that to make sure that, like you said, your legacy lives on. Mm-hmm. And my thing is, if I die today, I want to make sure that my family is taken care of the best that I can and make sure they don't have, they can celebrate my life rather than be stressed out about how are we going to bury them, how are we going to do this, how are we going to pay his stuff off, so... I can't even say some of the stuff I did when I was 17 and 18, you know, not, 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 you know, it's not even right, but you know, the, but you learn. And that's why I try so hard to tell some of these, these guys now and some of the young guys or guys I'm around, you know, man, man, you got to get your head on straight. Now these things come back to haunt you. Christian, he doesn't have any, you don't have any kids, do you Christian? No. Okay. So three of us that have kids 
here at the table. And uh, what do we what do we tell them? What do we tell these children? You know, just not just about the find out or just more or less about themselves. You know, I had written down here about their identity. How do you get them to uh, to realize, you know, why not we put all the teaching them that we can, but how do you get them to realize that you're going to need to be established, you know, now for what you're going to have face in the future? Well, for me, you know, uh, when my son, since he was a, a kid, since he was probably born, I started that process. Um, I've always, I'm, a, I'm an eldest, and being an eldest comes with responsibility. And being the eldest across the board in my family, I raised, he's the only child, but I've raised him as such. Was I always a good father? No. But as far as being responsible and responsibility and those types of things, um, that's something I always held him accountable, even to this day, you know. I held him, hold him accountable, and that's in teaching him how to be a black man in America, because I didn't seen it all. And I didn't think that I was going to see these different things, but I've seen a lot coming in, coming up in the world. And um, I tell him what he can, what he should do, what he don't do. And like my father, um, my father was one of the guys, type of guys, you know, he would like when I joined the military, I was sitting at home. I had just graduated not too long. And, and uh, he was, we were sitting at the kitchen table and he said, we said, well, what you going to do? And. I said, I don't know. I said, I'm not ready for college. He said, well, the military seems like a good good idea. So he walked out of the room. You know what that did? That helped me chew on some things, give me a start. And I kind of, I'm not saying I would want my son. I never wanted my son to join the military. I think my biological father, all is five of us have the same name and all of us served in the military. And I wanted to, to, to end with me. Okay. So um, just preparing him, telling him, hey, you got to put up money. You got to put money up. You have to... You got to go to school is important because not not just for the books to learn the system. And you guys in this room know what I'm talking about. You got to learn the system, the system other people created. We didn't create the system, but you have to learn it and you have to be able to function in between it. And you got to deal with the disappointments. You got to deal with people putting walls up against you and you still have to move forward. And the stuff that you see on, you know, on television, those types of things, um, Stuff that we've seen in the last couple of years has been happening with with, with uh, not so good officers and dealing mm-hmm. with those things, teaching him. No, it's more, it's more than books, especially uh, with us. You, it's more than a book, and and a lot of us that are that have the same pigmentation, we a lot of men outside of us, they don't take care of their kids. You know, yeah. we if you it's a it was a an article I read that we're the fatherless kids. So I didn't want to ever be that. I was, I'm, I'm just, I'm who I am every day. I've always been hard on my son, but my son got everything that he wanted, but he had to earn it. My son never went without, you know, with his mom, me and his grandmother. But for me, I was always like this because the way my dad was, you know, and I, I think with my dad being, it's not being mean, it's more of a structure. My dad structured me and I wanted to structure my son a little bit better than he did like jimmy said you want to do it better but um structure him to like hey you know you can't just bow down everything you have to have a plan and you have to go through it and you cannot give up because that's what they want you to do that's what some of these people out here want you to do so that's my whole thing <coughs> and being a dad was always progress pro- even now progress 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 you know when you get to a certain point in life where you can stop then um, when you'd have made enough progress, you think you have, but you really don't. I'm 43 years old. I still ain't, still feel like I'm not a complete person, you know. Right. Um, but that's what me is. My dad was a perfectionist, and uh, I don't take that from him. But he was always, "What's next? What you gonna do? You know, you can't just stop here." And one of the things I learned from the elders in my family, and I'm sure all of us has heard, is you not so much elders and family, just elders. Period. You hear people. When I was a youngster, and they'll say, "Well, I shoulda, woulda, coulda did this," and I always use that wisdom. I didn't want to get 43 years old. I didn't want to get to my deathbed and say I didn't complete the things that I wanted to do in life. And that's pretty much how I raised my son. Don't have regrets. Do what you want to do. As long as you're doing something positive, do what you want to do. Don't have regrets. When we get to our time, when when the Creator calls and say. Oh, I should have did this. Or I'm 60 years old. I, I could have been a doctor, but I dropped out of high school. I dropped mm-hmm. out of college, you know, or I could have did this. That's what I hope 
to instill in him and, and be respectful and learn some of the things that learn from my mistakes because I'm not perfect. I tell him all the time, your dad is not perfect. You know I'm not perfect. But take what I learned, take the negative, and when you have you a son or a daughter or if you have kids or not, do better. And take what I do well and transform it to even better. Especially the way we live. You said something about the police and everything else. It's hard for to uh, it seems like to teach not just the boy but the girl to even respect law enforcement now. But I, I the thing that I always tell them Things are more public now. You can see them on TV. This stuff been happening for years. I tell them, I say, so they think that sometimes that we're not getting excited enough. We're not getting involved. I mean, we're not mad enough. But man, this is nothing new to me. When I was a teenager, or even when I was a kid, the police used to do things. I said it before on one of the podcasts how the police picked us up. You know, we throwing snowballs and threw it at an unmarked police car. They got us up and they took us way over in Bridgeport. Uh, none of us lived over in Bridgeport. Mm. <laughs> I just say that. <laughs> none of us wanted to go over there, you know. Uh, and so that's the kind of things that we've seen happen before. And they get excited because they get to see it on uh, CNN and everything. You know, like these things are all new. These things are not new. So if I, I mean, uh, not to change the subject or anything like that, but with some of them, since we do. Uh, talking about it, kids, talking about the youth. I mean, when, when you say the names, I mean, like, or even think about some of the verdicts that just happened lately. You think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. You think about some of these things, you know. You know, I'm, I'm getting lost for words right now. Jimmy, you watch the news a lot. You remember, what was the, with the, uh... Rittenhouse you talking about? Oh. You talking about Cal Rittenhouse? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'm not gonna, just think of it. Now, when I was young, I was just looking at what happened two days ago. Two or three days ago with the kid, the fifteen year old kid in Michigan. Right. M- my, who buys a kid? A gun. Yeah. At fifteen. For his fifteen, you know. Yeah. I I was I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. I had a very cantankerous <laughs> childhood. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was good as far as my family was concerned, but the attitude and the things that I did you know, at a child, I mean, I, I've been in and out of juvenile detention center. Mm-hmm. You know, people, you know, they they don't really know it unless I say it. Because a lot of times when I start telling people that I've been in the group home, I've been in the juvenile detention center, I've been in level six placement, you know, people say, what? You know, <laughs> believe it. but they, they don't believe it, you know. And, uh... But, you know, I had, uh, you know, loving parents and and my mom, like I say, my mom, she was, she was, she had a hand on the gospel plow. I just (laughs) say it like that, you know, and she brought us up, you know, uh, the word of God and stuff. So we knew all of that, you know, and that's the scripture that says you teach a child the way he should go. When they grow old, they will not depart from it. And, uh. You know, so I have three sons, you know, and, uh, you know, they they started off kind of cantankerous, too. You know, you know, I still have a son in federal prison in Ohio. You know, uh, he'd be getting out in a few months, but he's like 45 years old. And I think he spent about half of his life in prison, you know, doing drugs and all of that. So but I raised him. He, he, he was raised in the same household as my other two sons, you know, and they had some run-ins and stuff with the law also, you know, and, you know, and I was trying to tell them, you know, that, you know, things are different for them. They are not going to get the same breaking stuff that other uh, people get and other kids get, you know, but, you know, and sometimes I get upset with them and things like that, but you know, I mean, they're they're in their early 30s now, and things beginning to come together for them and stuff now. You know, and I can see that all the hard work. And again, one when they grow old, they won't depart from it. Now they starting to fall back on the things that I had taught them, as far as you know, uh, respecting the law, respect and and uh, uh, other people and. Uh, you know, and this was, I think this is, uh, what, November? No, that's men's day was, what, November the 19th? I think it was. But uh-huh. anyway, anyway, okay. at church today, we had a men's day in, in our service and stuff. And the men was getting up and they were talking about, you know, 
uh, how how to be a man to be and, and and everybody out there, you will be surprised and amazed of uh, how many decent, honorable, hardworking black men that there really are. You know, yeah. I don't know what stereotypes and stuff oh, yeah, that yeah, that yeah. people be seeing mm-hmm. and stuff. But I would say, just, just, just living, say, oh, no, I'm not an exception. It's it's hundreds of men, you know, like me around, you know. Yeah. You know, I say, I can take you, I can take you. But there are people, it's, they've accomplished a lot more than I have, right. you know. So that, they're, 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 they're being out there, you know. But, you know, but what I see it on the day is that at the all, everything's over, you know, I was saying, well, the best thing a man can do for his children is to love their mother. That's that's what I yeah. had uh, said on today. But you know, you got to give give the, your children a little leeway. You know, I was at this point where, since I work with children, you know, I gave everything to my children that I possibly could. You know, with the kids I work with, when they said the things that they were missing and stuff. Those are the things that I went home and made sure I done for my kid. You know, even with them playing little league ball and basketball and football and, and going to uh, professional baseball games and yeah, basketball games that. and football. I, I just tried to take them to all of that. You know, so again, going back to the generational thing, so they can do the same thing, you know, for uh their children and stuff. Cause it was twelve of us in my family, and we didn't have a lot of money to to do all of those uh, things. You know, you know, we had barbecue neck bones and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, you know. But <laughs> they ain't never wrong with that. It was still, it, it was, it was, it, but it was still good. You yeah. know, it was still good. But like I say, if you teach your children the way, the right things they supposed to do, when they grow old, they'll fall back on. All right, that sounds pretty good. I like that, <laughs> <laughs> Kristen. You now you about the age of a lot of our children. I think yeah, all I my children are older. Like, oh, no. yeah, I just think you, you went to school with a couple of my daughters, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, right in that time frame. How are you? Thirty. Thirty. Yeah. You probably went to school with my son. I think so. He's thirty. Yeah. Yeah. He went with, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You went to JC High. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Now, Kristen, because and I know you travel. A lot. Mm-hmm. I used to, you know, in the state of Kansas. I'm, I made a statement once, and then I told some, this was at uh, uh, one of our staff at work once, said that, you know, they was talking about uh, people, uh, this is what they told me. They asked me once was, uh, they were coming from Manhattan to come to Junction City. Um, this address I'm going to, is in a bad part of Junction City? I said, ain't no bad part of Junction City. You know, they come, but, you know. I look at it like this. I told them this one. I made a statement. I said, I can be here in Junction City. You know, people talk about, oh, it's so uh, um, diverse and everything like this. And you know, I know, you know, you know, mm-hmm. okay. So we can, you could travel north, south, east, and west about 20 some miles, and you may not see me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? Right. So they, it, they say it's, 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 it's diverse, but I know that you have to go into communities and areas sometimes, and, and you're helping. See, it's not just our boys that's out that's doing better. But I know if you've seen others in these areas uh, in foster care, in and out of foster care, or in some type, you know, not just because the parents were, but you got some kids that's doing some things too. Mm-hmm. I know you've seen a lot. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. yeah. So what do, what do you think about, you know, as far as that and the, the young men and the kids? Because you're going to have kids one day, Christian. Yeah. You know that? <laughs> well, my thing is, uh, that's why I try to be around people that are older than me and wiser than me so I can pick up on those things that I may not catch on my own. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, with my dad, my dad was around. He was in the military, so, of course, he did a lot of deployments, a lot mm-hmm. of field training and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, but the biggest thing for me was time. And even when I talk to the kids now, I don't, I couldn't tell you very many of the toys I got or the things I got growing up, but I can tell you about the times we went fishing, mm-hmm. times he take me to the gym, mm-hmm. times we sat down, he made me do my homework, even though I didn't want to. Mm-hmm. I can guarantee you if I didn't have that structure, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that he gave me that time and he was present and when he was there, he was there. He wasn't running around. He wasn't on his phone. He wasn't on the computer all day. He was there and we engaged in activities together. And so, to me, that was a big thing that I think a lot of these kids are missing now. Either the father's not in the home or 
they're not spending very much time together. And so I think when kids have too much time on their hands, they start getting around the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And so that's when all the trouble starts picking up and they start getting influenced by other people. And I told people, I disagreed with my dad on a lot of things because I thought he was too strict and he wanted everything done a certain way. And I was starting to realize he was right. Mm -hmm. And so to me, those are things that I pick up. And it, it took me until I was probably 28 before I realized mm -hmm. my dad had any kind of sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wise guy, very smart, very educated. Um, but I didn't see it until yeah. I started getting older. Mm -hmm. And that's where you don't want to give up on your kids too soon. Right. You don't want to give up on them, period. But right. again, at some point, it's going to click in. Mm -hmm. It might be 30, could be 40. It might be 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. But at some point, those things that you put into them, it's going to connect with them. And that's where mm -hmm. they start to come back. Even if they've departed, they start to come back because those things that you've instilled in them have stuck with them over the years. I think that's very important. I mean, I I can my grandson, y'all know yeah, my grandson. Yeah. That, yeah, Anthony is like my son to me. I'm not like his father. He had the father. You understand what I'm saying? And he respects his father. But I can remember, you know, anybody who remembers, every time we went out to eat with the brothers or went, some, went to a game or anything like that, he was there. Whether he was interested in baseball or any of that stuff, I ain't more interested in band. When his harsh desire was to be a police officer, mm -hmm. what is he now? A police, police officer, officer yeah. you know. And so it's good to where you know we support what they want to do when when they're young. When he uh, had an opportunity to do something else besides uh, being a policeman, you know, and making twice as much money that uh, he was going to, I was on jump on, you know, I was looking at the dollar mm -hmm. and and everything, but. He, you got to look at too what they what their heart is, what they want to do, enjoy. what they enjoy doing. Look at your daughter. When I see her down there at, 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 at Dylan, she's so happy. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just really hey, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I give her my uh, date of birth, and you know, yeah. I just zoom on out of there. You know, and it's good to see our kids happy mm -hmm. to what they're doing. And it's good, Joe. I see Joe. Joe's always talking about his son. You know. And, 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 and the kids, or whatever. I have daughters, you know. I, I respect what they do. I love what they do. I have a daughter that's working with me now and everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, we got a population that that we want to reach, but it's whatever we do is what they're going to pass on. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm from a city in Chicago. I'm from the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm from a city in Illinois, mm -hmm. Chicago. And everyone is talking about uh, how bad Chicago is now. If you look at the news, you look at the murder rate. 14 and 15 year olds doing these um, mm -hmm. murders. 14, 12, and 13 are doing these carjackings, they say. Not just in Chicago, but there, um, one, I read an article in, in the, uh, one of the newspaper links on uh, um, WG and one of them, and they were talking about a school in Chicago that has had fights since they returned from the pandemic every day, multitude of fights, pulling the fire alarm every day. Now we're hearing it in this city, in, and we found out not just in Chicago, but Junction City, uh, clear across the United States. And uh, a lot of people are blaming this on the pandemic, you know, and that's why, you know, the kids were shut in too long. They missed social skills. If you heard anything about our school here, you know, in the uh, from the middle school, they had a lot of uh, incidents last year. Now in this freshman year, you know, where they got all these freshmen together, they're uh, having a lot of problems now. So this is not, people think it's just isolated to Junction City. The school is bad. They built a new school. They're tearing up the high school stuff. But clear, uh, all across the United States, this thing is happening. Joe, but you I, work in the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I look at it this view, you know, when you look at the schools, all of us here are from the Midwest. You know, Jimmy from St. Louis. I know you have Indiana connections. You from Chicago. I'm from Cleveland, you know. So for me, going to school in the 90s all of this stuff has been going on to me you know mm -hmm. it just with social media and the way it gets out okay. it's different all this stuff in the inner cities and i know at one point i wasn't here during that time but i've heard in Junction city they had different things going on in the, in the 90s so mm -hmm. uh kind of like what's going on now in the high school but I feel that it's been going on for a long time. It's just now with the social media, now you get you can you don't have to wait for the newspaper. Something happens, somebody film it, boom, mm -hmm. it's viral. You had to wait for newspapers to wait to get on news. I think this this whole thing with the violence in schools have been going on for a very long time. And um, I only can speak from my generation. Um, we did the same thing, and that's why I had to leave. You know, because I felt either I was going to kill somebody, somebody was going to kill me. I had to go. 
And that really what it came down to, the conversation I was having with my father, you know. I've never, you know, and it was hard growing up in the inner city because I wasn't affiliated. You know, it's it, a lot of times when you, in my generation, you had to be affiliated with some type of gang or organization. And I refused to do that. You know, my uncle, he, he was into all that stuff. But me, I always looked at it like, if I got to get beat up to be part of an organization, <laughs> then that ain't for me. So it would, I had to do things. I've always did things, you know, not the easy way. So, you know, those those violent things has always happened. I remember uh, I had guys that I played on the football team. We went to a, um, a charity competition on the west side of town. And Cleveland is really separated by east and west, and then you have south, but really east and west. And we went on the west side of town, and uh, the guy, uh, uh, I didn't ride with him, but he had a, a car with, at the time, the Dayton's on it. And he played, he didn't sell any drugs. He played football and everything else. And he got into it with uh, some guys that were affiliated at the high school at the cheerleading competition. They got down the road after, uh, shot him right in the head, you know. You know, that's we, this type of stuff has been going on. The people acting out. Um, I would have thought people, the kids being at home and parents being at home would have been a, the, the direct opposite because this day and time, we spend more time working. I always say that. I spend more time when we all work together. I spend more time with y'all than I ever spent at home. You know, I'm, I'm with y'all most of the day. So when, I, when I'm off from you guys, I try to spend time at home. But the violence and stuff, I just think it's been going on. Um, in, in school district, it doesn't matter if you're a big school district or a small school district because I worked in Clay County. I've seen some of the things that happen over there and here in Gary, uh, Manhattan. You know, it's this stuff type of stuff has been going on forever. So I just think it's more publicized now that we um, we have more social media and people are more aware with, you know, with, mm-hmm. with Facebook, TikTok and all these different things. They can post that stuff real quick, you know. So uh, I just think some this hasn't been addressed and it's even go back to Columbine, the, the whole thing that's been going on in the schools, I always, when I talk in private with people, it didn't really come to the forefront until it happened in Colorado. Mm-hmm. All this stuff, and, and a well-to-do community in Colorado, all this stuff has been happening, even in, Mr. You, you're older than me, I'm sure mm-hmm. in Chicago during that time, they mm-hmm. would have things going on. Mm-hmm. I'm sure in St. Louis when you was in school, they had things, but it wasn't put on the forefront because this is the inner city who cares about them. But when they hit Colorado and they had the, the Columbine issue and those kids did what they did in Columbine, the violence has always been there. It's just where it happens. If it happens in the inner city, it's, 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 it's looked at and then it's gone about your business. But when it happens in, in a community where you got millionaire people or, uh, or um, um, people who making a lot of money, then that's when it's, it's an issue. A lot of the initiatives now in schools, uh, even the bullying policies, that's been that's really started when Columbine happened because I knew kids and I'm sure you guys know kids that have been bullied since kindergarten mm-hmm. all the way through high school if they made it. Mm-hmm. Didn't have nobody to talk to. So that's just my opinion that it's always been there. It just it took Columbine and a couple of these other things for it to come to the forefront. So now people are stepping in saying, well, we want to put this initiative, Joseph, we want to uh, do talk about bullying, which is good, which is good, but it should have been done a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Kristen, do you go to the school? Um, or you, you, not as much anymore, but I still work with the, the boys that are, that are mm-hmm. in state custody. And I think, I, I think you kind of hit it right on the head. I think before it, it was happening a lot, but with social media, I think it's encouraging more people. So the kids that normally wouldn't act out, I think they're tending to because they see it on social media. Mm-hmm. And so what better way to get people to like me than to go do something stupid that is going to go viral? And now you got kids that weren't necessarily getting in trouble before now acting out and doing the same thing because I want to be cool like the other guy. And so I think that's pushing a lot of people, but it, like I said too, it's it's out there now. And that's what I keep trying to get these kids to understand is this stuff ain't going to go away. Like, clearly, you committed a crime, and obviously, there's going to be consequences, but they don't think about that ahead of time. It's just, how do I get people to like me? How do I get popular? How can I get 1,000, 200,000 views? <laughs> and then they're going oh, around that, doing dumb do things, yeah. and it's just encouraging them. And yeah, I, I think social media plays a big, big role now. Just to make me think about something, too, is that 
A lot of these problems didn't start, I might see arrogant saying this, in the school till they pull us out of the school, Jimmy. <laughs> 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 now they, they want us back in the school. But I remember we used to, you know, our agency was in the school, had office set up in the school. Mm-hmm. Daily. We met, I'm, I, and these fights that they talk about happening every here and there, we used to see them every day. I done had kids put... Try to choke me out, you know. Yeah. Then I got in trouble. Yeah. You know, you know. We we've seen these things have. I mean, teachers getting punched right in the face. Oh, if that yeah. would happen, and, and somebody videotape that, that'd be all over the United mm-hmm. States. It'll be all uh, uh, Anderson Cooper and the rest of them would be down here. Definitely Fox News, you know. Oh, they yeah. give that, you know, all of them would be down oh, here. Yeah. But you 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 look at it is that when they we had certain different types of support in the school, not just the support in the school. But you had certain different things, um, people, um, not just uh, Piney Mental Health or, you know, our agency supporting the classroom, but they had classrooms uh, for some of this, uh, and not just the aggressive kids, but kids with uh, mental problems. Now, well, I think what happens is that uh, when you put them out in a bigger setting, I mean, nobody sees them, nobody, you know. Teacher could recognize something different when you got eight, ten class. I don't care how much they want to make fun of it, but when you had a smaller classroom, you know, you had that many. They could pick up on the behavior. Of somebody they could they were the teacher that was there was trained in mental health. She was trained in different areas uh, of uh, special ed. Now you just want to you know get rid of the special ed and just send somebody with them, send a pair or send there to uh, with them all day and stuff. It was time that uh, we had kids that was really so violent, certain uh, Jimmy and I, maybe you guys too, when you were in school, uh, Joseph, I yeah. remember you were with them 20, well, not 24, that whole school, school day. day. Yep. Every move they're making, you have to recognize on what, you know, have to be aware of what they may do, you know. And these are the things that's happening. Now, these kids, I think a lot of them are falling, you know, falling through the cracks, you know. On some of you know of what the education system uh, is coming to right now, you know. Uh, um, I'll let you guys say something, but I had um, a kid the other day, and we've seen this a lot. I, I wrote something out in cursor. I can't read cursor. Mm. Sign your name on it. I don't know how to sign. I don't know how to sign a cursor. You know, they don't, they almost don't know what the word is. You know, and not saying that that's causing them to fall through crap, but it's certain things they're not teaching anymore. They're more worried about them teaching critical race theory in the school that they are, you know, about teaching, giving them education, you know, all, they, it's all about what you don't want them to learn, you know, about what you do want them to learn. <laughs> that critical race theory, that's they, just mm-hmm. uh, another word for uh, get back in your place probably, <laughs> you know, but you think about it, it, it was a time where you get you get caught with a book, you get whipped. <laughs> you know they don't want you to learn about what's going on. I was thinking I was born in the nineteen fifties. I was thinking, well, was nobody saying that when they made me read Little Black Sambo? <laughs> you know, no. you know, or Huckleberry Finn, or or, or or Tom Sawyer, or nothing like that and stuff. You know, so you know they they're not really worried about that. But it seemed like to me that everything that was done in the past now everything is all coming together at one time the things that we were led to believe you know now all of a sudden you know what that never was true you know Columbus discovered America you know Columbus (laughs) sailed the ocean blue in 1492 you know, and now all of a sudden, okay, you know, uh, we just call it indigenous people day. We yeah. ain't, it ain't Columbus Day no more. But 400 years, they got away with it, with mm-hmm. that, you know. And uh, the critical race theory, all of that stuff, you know, they don't want us to, to know about more. It seems like, you know, they're ashamed of the way they acted, but they don't want no one to be able to talk about it. You know, uh, uh, don't don't make my little child feel bad, but it was okay when it was done to us, okay. you know. And uh, well, I would say one thing, and back in the 50s and stuff, okay, what about with uh, Governor Wallace and all of that standing yeah, out in front of school with a bat and stuff? See, when I was coming up, they was integrating school, so all of this stuff was going on, but it was on the other side, you know. And and, and 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 a lot of people didn't want to talk about that. And now, even right today, 
they don't want to want you don't to. want us to talk about that. You know, and so that's why they talking about some critical race theory and all of that stuff. It's just that uh they don't want you to know the way they acted and the way they're still acting. And that's that's moving on from just the school. <laughs> I, I, something happened last week. I, I'm I'm always on best selling trade trying to buy something and everything. You know, trying to see what they might have to sell or thing. And the lady was selling like a ceramic thing with a black kid in the piece yeah, of watermelon. Yeah. What did you see that? Yeah. And they are and this this is that's not in California. That's, that's here right in Junction here. City. That's yeah. Right here. And the comments, I was reading the comments about people, you know, nobody really, uh, I don't think they were African American people that commented out first, that this is a sensitive thing, maybe you're not going to sell that, or why are you putting, you know, and it, people just start honing in, talking about, well, you need to get past that. That's part of history. What part of history? They said that's part of history. But they don't want you to teach but they don't want you to Yeah. Don't let me, don't let me get on yeah. that. <laughs> so, it's just, you get on the joke. It's just the thing, you know. Okay, I know you're wondering, what happened? Why did it just cut off like that? Well, we had to limit that a little bit. It's extra long because when us fellas get together talking, we talk. And we hope that you enjoyed it. Part two will be coming to you next week. So look for us. It'll be the same thing. Four men, four mics. But it'll say part two instead of part one. So we look forward to you listening again. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you for listening to another episode of Experience, Strength, and hope. Please go support, subscribe, and follow on Spotify, Anchor FM, and Apple Podcasts. For questions and comments, we can be reached at bigdog0862 at me.com. Again, this is Catherine, and thank you for listening.